Hi, this is Bob of Bob World Builder, and you are listening to Tale of the Manticore. The following podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Tale of the Manticore, Season 2. Like the creature from which it takes its name, Tale of the Manticore is a mashup, a crossbreeding between two different species of storytelling. Here, you will find the unpredictability of old-school RPG paper and dice games with the storycraft of a dark fantasy novel. No character is sacred, and no character will be spared if the dice decide their fate is at hand. According to lore, the tale of a manticore is barbed with cruel iron spikes. There will be much pain in the days ahead. Last time on Tale of the Manticore. Episode 24 opens with a dramatis personae in which we learn a little more about King Culfrey, or King Culfrey the Terrible, as his subjects often call him. After that, we get a somewhat underwhelming level up for Sean A before joining the main narrative. The story throughout the whole episode is really only about one thing, the mission for Sister Araness to get back the Holy Symbol. To accomplish this, they have a plan, and like most good plans, this one requires groundwork. For the past three weeks, she has been visiting the Tower of the City Watch, along with two of her trusted scholars and Catsbane and Sean A, who are disguised as novice clerics. These visits have ostensibly been for the purpose of studying the artifact. Actually, Aranus's team has not been doing much other than trying to lull the guard into complacency. A day comes that Aranus has decided will be their fourth and final visit. A new captain of the City Watch has been appointed, and she wants to execute her plan before the man can make any significant changes. The idea is not complicated. They will bring a fake holy symbol. Creating this fake is another reason why they did not act sooner, by the way, and try to make the switch through sleight of hand when a good opportunity presents itself. There are no good opportunities in the end, only risky ones, so Shawnee is forced to gamble on her skill and make the switch with the guard only a few feet away. The risk pays off, and her timing proves to be perfect. Shawnee swaps the fake symbol for the real one when the guard turns his back for a moment, and the mission is a success. Chapter 25, Part 1, Day 105, Evening, Party Status, Yellowfly, 19 of 19 hit points, Cole, 18 of 18, Shawnee, 16 of 16, Catsbane, 8 of 8, Spells Available, Catsbane has memorized, Read Languages, Magic Missile, and Mirror Image. Although it was not particularly late, it looked like the dead of night. Moonlight reflected on the snow, the wind pushed across the dirty streets and into dark alleyways. Catsbane picked his way carefully across a patch of icy cobbles with his shoulders hunched and the hood of his cloak pulled tightly over his head. He was coming from the Church of the Sacred Flame and heading for a tavern in the High Market District. Sister Araness had arranged to meet him outside the church's back door just after sunset. She had been late, and Catsbane had been forced to wait in the cold, shivering until the door finally opened. Araness had been brief and unapologetic. Neither was there a thank you, congratulations, or even a smile. He had returned a book she had insisted he borrow. It was an interesting history about Aylward the Silverthorn Paladin, champion of the people, and ultimately the nemesis of King Vincis. A lot of what the book said he already knew, though it presented an alternative perspective he could appreciate. She had accepted the book without a word and pushed a small box into his hand, telling him that it contained payment for their successful mission. Catsbane had thanked her and asked her if she had learned anything new since bringing back the holy symbol. She had then given him a strange and penetrating look, as though she were unsure of his motive for asking. Then she had shaken her head mildly, replied with a simple no, and withdrawn, shutting the door behind her without so much as a goodbye. Catsbane had been a little confused at all of this, but supposed it mattered little to him. Should he be surprised? After all, they had both been playing roles, not just him. All of their recent interactions had been for show. He had pretended to be a novice, 
and she had pretended to be interested in his well-being. He felt a little embarrassed to have thought otherwise. He also felt cold, even colder now, as he trudged through the snowy streets into a wind that seemed to be blowing against him no matter which way he turned. Then, finally, up ahead, he saw it. A homey-looking cob-built structure with a slightly rounded facade. This kind of clay-built construction was popular in Nepal and the other towns and villages to the west, Cole had told him. There was light peeking through the closed shutters of the windows. A plume of white smoke sprouted from the chimney. Ah, salvation was just ahead. A little bell tinkled when he opened the door, and it rang again when he closed it behind him, shutting out the wind and cold. He felt the warmth from the hearth right away, and relief and gratitude filled him as he scanned the room for his friends. He found them quickly, seated at a table amongst the modest crowd of other patrons. He grinned as he walked up, and Shawnee pulled out a chair for him without getting up. Oh, mother's tears, it's cold out there, he said. Let's get something warm into you, yeah? suggested Yellowfly. He looked at the box in Catsbane's hand. Is that what I hope it is? Catsbane nodded, still grinning. Looked inside yet? Catsbane shook his head. No, not yet. Well, go on then, said Shawnee. Don't keep us waiting, Catsbane. Open the box. Don't worry. This isn't that kind of what's-in-the-box moment. This is a good thing. The little box really does contain the companion's payment for retrieving the holy symbol. Inside, they find a purse with the expected 100 gold coins, but they also find something special, and the second item is where the excitement comes from. Part of the deal with Araness included a magical potion as part of the payment. Magic items are rare, and, other than Catsbane, none of the PCs had ever even seen one before the Lord Rabbit gave them his enchanted gloves. If you're wondering about the little dwarven crystal Catsbane carries, the other PCs do not know about it. He feels they would only be alarmed by it, and he's right to feel that way. Of course, Catsbane has some experience with enchanted items, but for the others, a magic potion is extremely exotic. I've already decided by DM Fia that this potion will be a healing potion. But to keep things interesting, let's add a random element. I'm going to roll a d6. On a 1 to 3, it will be a simple, single dose of a regular healing potion. On a 4 to a 6, it'll be two doses, which can be split or used together for double effect. Interestingly, according to the BX rules, a healing potion can also be used to cure paralysis. Rolling. A 6! Well, look at that. It's a double. You're saying this little thing contains two doses of the serum? Asked Jellifly, astonished. He was holding a glass vial, no more than two inches long, between his thumb and forefinger. Such a little thing. Are you sure it'll work? Quite certain, replied Catsbane. Then it is truly a treasure. I should ask you to keep it. It looks a little too delicate for the rest of us to carry. Yellowfly tucked the vial back into the cocoon of cloth that had come wrapped in and handed it to Catsbane, who carefully secured it in his belt pouch. The rest of the evening was spent in celebration over mugs of frothy ale and bowls of Shawnee's favorite meal, pork bone soup with bannocks and fried onions. She rubbed a little scar on her chin unconsciously before digging into the hot and savory meal. The tavern they were in was called the Jester's Cup, and it was not so different from a dozen other modest taverns south of the Three Gate Wall, but it did manage to differentiate itself in a few little ways. One, it was proudly Nepilic. The owners and all of the staff hailed from there. Two, it featured only Nepilic talent. This meant that on any given night, the entertainment was a mixed bag. One never knew what they might hear or see. Nepilic musicians were not always available. Sometimes there was no entertainment at all. On others, such as this night, the entertainment was something a little unusual. A juggler came out first to warm up the crowd. She wore a cap of motley with a jingle bell sewn into the tip of its floppy peak. It kept falling in her face, and, mugging for comic effect, she would blow it out of the way with mock desperation, appearing to almost lose control as she juggled. Instead of colored balls, she used cups. It was a good laugh, and the crowd seemed to enjoy it. After 20 minutes of foolery, her act was complete. She circulated the motley cap and collected coins from those who wished to contribute a tip. Shawnee dropped a silver piece into the hat when someone passed it to her. Finally, the juggler retired to a second round of hearty applause, and the main event began. This performer was dressed in gaudy and somewhat shabby robes of yellow brocade. A conical hat with strange runes embroidered onto it topped a head of long white hair. Though aged, Imun the Amazing was a seasoned entertainer who made up for his lack of youth and vitality with a showman's flair. He was a self-styled illusionist who executed several tricks using cards, colored sticks, and even a trembling brown hair. 
The finale was an illusion he had promised was no sleight of hand, but true magic. He called it Eamon the Amazing's Spectacular Trolls Fire, and after an almost laughable amount of posturing accompanied by ostentatious jibber-jabber, did manage to somehow conjure an arc of bright green flame between the palms of his two outstretched hands. Observe. The crowd gasped in awe and appreciation, and then the emerald tongue of flames vanished, and the show was over. Ebon the Amazing took a very deep bow to each corner of the room, and then his yellow hat was sent around for tips. A gold coin went into the hat for the magician, and Shane hoped it would still be in the hat by the time it returned to its owner. Looking at this crowd of good, honest folk, she was fairly sure it would be. Yellowfly settled the bill with the serving girl, another three gold coins, before the companions drained the last of the ale from their cups and put on their cloaks. Outside, it was bracingly cold. A full moon lit the city with a silvery glow as the companions made their way back south through the cobbles and then cut across the South Gate district towards their apartment. When they were still several minutes from home, Yellowfly, who was in the lead, suddenly took a sharp turn down the wrong street. It led into the southern section of the Warrens, a dangerous neighborhood at this time of night. Confused, but sensible enough not to put voice to question, the others followed, hunched against the biting wind. I'd like you to join me on a journey into danger and mystery. Are you looking for an action and intrigue-packed solo RPG podcast? One that tells a compelling story and then pulls back the curtain. The Lone Adventurer is split 50-50. Half is a dramatic audiobook-style story set in a dark fantasy magitech world. And half is a step-by-step -step guide. A guide to how the drama has been created, how solo RPGs work, and how you can create solo adventures of your own. M. Guns gave this review. I have listened to a few different iterations of fantasy storytelling, and this one rates at the top along with me, myself, and I. And Mr. Pizzle had this to say, Carl has really knocked it out of the park with this one. Amazing production, and pulls you into the story right off the bat. You can find The Lone Adventurer on the podcatcher of your choice, on YouTube, or at theloneadventurer.podbean.com. The adventure is just getting started. I hope you'll join me. Dramatis Personae Shawnee On the day Shawnee turned 13 years old, Dacha, her urchin lord, sat her down for a special talk. You become a woman grown today, me puppet, he began, reaching down to scratch the flea bites on his legs. You done me proud. You're a good little thief, even if you've no skill with a begging cup. Dacha was a big, sweaty man with brown teeth. His beard was a tangled mass of hair, glued together in clumps by grime and bits of food. He carried himself with confidence, and perhaps he had reason to be proud of himself, for he had grown up with nothing, not a copper to his name. And now he was an urchin lord, with a stable of five children, until today, that is. He had never had a child reach adulthood before. He used to think that when his wards came of age, he would dismiss them. Controlling children was easy, but young adults were trouble. Then, as Shawnee neared the age of 13, he found that his mind was beginning to change. By the time her birthday arrived, he had made a decision. A woman grown, he repeated. He wore a cheap copper ring on his right index finger, and he twisted it around as he spoke. The ring bore a little false diamond made of glass. Dacha knew it was a fake, but he thought it looked well on him anyway. Shawnee was little more than a waif back then. She kept still and silent, knowing better than to interrupt. Dacha took care of her. But, if she annoyed him, he would not hesitate to beat her. After today, you no longer beg for pennies, he said. A mix of dread and hope began to kindle in little Shawnee's heart. Still, she remained wisely mute. From today, you'll earn money as an adult, you understand? He pointed at various underdeveloped parts of her body with his ringed finger as he spoke. As an adult woman, you understand? b, -b stammered Shawnee. The hope had curdled. You... You've always said that I'm not, not, not p pretty. You're not, Dacha confirmed. But there's always someone willing to pay for flesh. Where well, someone will have you. I, I can't. I don't know how. You can. You'll learn. In fact, I have arranged for you to meet someone later today. Happy birthday. Shane was sent to meet with the man that evening. 
There was an orchard outside the city walls where this sort of thing was known to take place. And so it was under the apple trees that Shawnee had her first experience working in Silmoral's oldest profession. But that experience turned out differently than she had expected. It happened that the man who had booked her for the evening was a very strange and rare kind of person. By his pallor and by the sores on his skin, she could see right away that he had some kind of disease, and she had braced herself for a truly harrowing experience. But the man did not even want to touch her. He had purchased her so that they might speak, he told her. With only months left to live, as his body slowly deteriorated, he had come to realize that what he wanted, above all, was to repent the life of reckless luxury that had led to his current condition. Now he spent his money buying time with the girls of the city in hopes that he might convince them to leave their lives of danger and sin. It wasn't so much religion that drove him, he said, though Vesaluna knew he was trying to be a righteous man. It was philosophy. Before their time was up, he had smiled at her and told her to think on everything he had said and to learn from his mistakes. He had advised her to take control of her own life and make a change, and said that she should live for today because she might not see the morrow. The tremendous overwhelming relief that Shawnee felt when she left him and went home for the evening with a handful of silver coins was extremely short-lived. That same night, when she went to bed on the mattress she shared with the other children and laid her head down on its dirty, pillowless surface, she realized that she had only avoided fate for a single day. There would be dozens upon dozens of meetings under the apple trees in which she would not be so fortunate. Shawnee could not bear the thought of going back even one more time and resolved to follow the odd man's advice. The next time Dacha asked, she would make a stand and refuse to go. It came up the very next day. Dacha was eating his favorite meal, pork bone soup and bannocks. He had only taken a single slurp when she interrupted him. Dacha. Oh, I, I forgot, said Dacha, misunderstanding her intent and throwing her a bannock. She put it aside without eating it, and he blinked in confusion. Was this? Bannock's no good anymore. No, she said, shaking her head. It's not that. Listen, I've decided I'm no good at this new kind of work, and I don't... I won't do it anymore. She didn't even realize that her little fists, held at her sides, were tightly clenched. Dacha set his soup bowl on the rough wooden table and rose. This was not a good sign. Oh, you won't, hey? Shawnee backed up a step, but there was nowhere to go. Their apartment was so tiny, it barely had room for the table and mattresses. Every dog, no matter how good, needs to be whipped now and then, he muttered to himself. Then he pulled back his elbow, and <clears throat> his meaty fist struck her in the face. Shawnee's vision filled with black stars. <clears throat> He hit her again in the chin and she hit the floor. The first punch would later result in two black eyes, though by some miracle it missed breaking her nose. On the second punch, Dutch's cheap ring cut a straight line one inch long down her chin. She would wear the scar for the rest of her life. When she picked herself off the floor, she knew some time had passed because Dutch was back in his seat, noisily eating his pork bone soup and munching on bannocks. Seeing her awake, he pointed at her with his spoon. His lips were speckled with crumbs when he spoke. I couldn't give you away looking like that. See what you made me do. The children will go hungry now. That's your fault, you stupid girl. Shawnee had barely understood a word. She was living in a world of pain and shock. Dacha seemed to consider the business concluded, for he went back to his meal as though nothing had happened. But the gods must have been watching and decided to intervene then, for a little pork bone found its way onto Dacha's spoon, then into his mouth and finally his throat, where it lodged sideways. The big man's eyes flew open and his mouth turned into an O. Tears streamed down his cheeks as he sat straight up like a masterless puppet. <coughs> then he started to choke. Great whooping coughs came out of him. The stream of tears turned into rivers. Then he turned a kind of pale blue color and fell over. Stone dead. Chapter 25, Part 1, Day 105, Evening, Party Status. The party status is unchanged. Yellowfly led them further into the South Warrens without increasing their speed. <coughs> he coughed three times and touched his nose, then coughed again. Cole replied with a little cough of his own. This was one of the first thieves' cant signals he and Tamlin had been taught after they'd been sworn in. Yellowfly's coded message meant they were being followed. 
Cole's reply meant he understood. There was no question as to Shawnee's understanding. She'd known as soon as Yellowfly pointed them in their current direction. The South Warren was where the neighborhood really earned its name. It was a labyrinth of narrow alleys, hideouts, and known dead ends. They moved into the moonless shadow of one such alley and came to a halt. There were some crates here, empty other than for some snow the wind had managed to blow into them. Yellowfly directed his companions to hide behind these crates, while he and Shane pulled knives from their boots and flattened themselves against the wall. They waited, watching the snow fall lightly into the street beyond as through a window. Still, they waited. Catsbane calculated their pursuer must pass by or follow them into the alley soon, if they'd been close enough to tell them this far. The wind and the falling snow would be covering their footprints only a few seconds after they were made. Shawnee glanced back from her position nearest the street. Yellowfly caught her expression, then nodded, and she poked her head out to take a look. The party is being tailed. Yellowfly was right about that. But their pursuer is starting to believe they're being led into an ambush. Currently, they're standing behind a corner about 30 feet away, trying to hide in the shadows as they reassess the situation. I'll roll off Mike to see if Shawnee can see them when she peeks her head out of the alley. Of course, she is also trying to remain unseen, but as for her ability to hide in shadows, that's a role I'll make in the open. She has a 25% base chance for success here. I might be tempted to modify this. There's snow falling, it's the dead of night, and so on. But their pursuer is essentially looking right at the alley she's peeking out from. I'm going to call it a straight roll. Rolling D percentile. Ugh, a 31. It's a close thing, but the weather betrays her and an errant gust of wind lifts up a stray lock of hair not held down by her hood, and the pursuer catches the movement. Shawnee saw a figure dressed in a hooded brown robe standing in an alley, kitty corner to their position. The person was close enough that if it weren't for the snow, she could have seen their face. Judging by the size and shape of the body, it looked like a man. Time stood still as the two faced each other across the street, with a curtain of silver and white flakes gently falling down between them. Neither side knew if they were visible to the other. A gust of wind blew a frosty mist of snow into Shawnee's face. She blinked, and when she opened her eyes, the hooded stranger was fleeing back the way they had come. Without a second's hesitation, Shawnee bolted after them. Shawnee, with the other PCs right behind her, is in pursuit of the person who's been following them. BXD&D doesn't have any rules governing pursuit. AD&D does have some evasion rules, but these are not especially dramatic, and they come down to making a single percentile dice roll. There are plenty of homebrew rules out there, and these tend to be more exciting, so I'm going to make up something on the spot. The pursuit will happen like this. Shawnee and the PCs will need to make three successful initiative checks before they make three failures. To avoid an endless stalemate, I'm going to say that every round, a new modifier will be added. This should increase the chance for a quick result. Given that Shawnee and her companions know this territory better than their quarry, I'm giving them a plus one to their roll right off the bat. Some other information to consider is that both sides are moving at roughly the same speed, and that the distance between the two parties to start with is about 35 feet. Let's begin. Round one. The stranger. A five. The PCs. A one plus one. That's one failure for the PCs. Instead of running down the road, the stranger dashes down their narrow alley and has turned a corner before Shawnee can see which way they went. She loses precious moments before she notices a bit of snow on the otherwise bare ground and renews her pursuit. The stranger will receive plus one to their roll and the distance between the two parties will increase to 40 feet. Round two, the stranger. A six plus one is seven. The PCs. A five plus one is six. Shawnee bursts into the street at full tilt. She can just see the tail of the stranger's cloak as they duck into yet another alley. Her lungs burn, but she does not give up. The stranger now receives a plus two as line of sight is broken once again. The distance expands to 45 feet. That's two failures for the PCs now. Uh oh. Round three, the stranger. Two plus two is four. The PCs. I've rolled a one, plus one is two. That's three failures in a row. By the time Shawnee reaches the alley, the stranger is gone. <laughs> Yellowfly, Cole, and Catsbane catch up a few seconds later to find Shawnee breathing hard and shaking her head in defeat. Thank you for listening to Tale of the Manticore. If you've enjoyed the show and would like to help out, there are lots of ways to do so. 
You can recommend it online or to friends. You can like and retweet episode announcements on Twitter. You can pick up One Shot in the Dark, the Pendulum World Building Tool, or Encyclopedia Manticorica on DriveThruRPG. Finally, you can rate or review the show on your podcatcher of choice. My thanks to everyone who has supported the show. As you know, I'd like to share one of your kind reviews every episode. Today's is from Apple Podcasts and was posted by Puddington the Third. Puddington writes, I wasn't looking for a serious D&D podcast when I ran across Tale of the Manticore. Personally, I'm a big fan of comedic ones when they're done well. In fact, I resisted listening for a long time after hearing the trailer. So imagine my surprise upon finally giving it a shot to find I was instantly hooked. It could be said to be built from D&D cliches, surly dwarves, goblin fights, evil sorcerers, etc. But you know what? Bricks are cliché too, and sometimes they get assembled into beautiful monuments. I declare this podcast an expertly crafted monument to basic D&D. Ah, Puddington the Third. I feel seen, or should I say I feel heard? Anyway, I think you really get what I'm trying to do with Tale of the Manticore, especially in Season 1. Yes, the cliches abound, guilty as charged, but it's all a love letter to my favorite hobby. Some D&D podcasts go for the laughs, a few of us go for the tears, but there's no right or wrong way to do it, is there? Thanks very much for that great review. My thanks are also due to the wonderful folks whose voices bring the story to life. I didn't have the heart to ask anyone to voice Dacha, so this episode features just one guest actor. Catsbane is voiced by Kyellen, who always gets it just right. He's got music on SoundCloud, and it's free for anyone to use. You can also find it on Spotify, Bandcamp, and other music stores. If anyone listening wants to get in touch with me, I'm on the usual socials, at Manticore Tale on Twitter, or Tale of the Manticore Podcast on Instagram. My email is taleofthemanticore at gmail.com. Finally, I keep a blog where I post all kinds of show and RPG-related stuff, like art, maps, tables, crafts, and show notes. You can find it at taleofthemanticore.blogspot.com. The adventure will continue on the next episode of Tale of the Manticore, the story where chaos rolls. Do you like your tabletop RPGs to be grim, gritty, and grounded? If so, then Legend of the Bones is the podcast for you. A mix of old-school solo D&D and dark fantasy storytelling. In Legend of the Bones, the dice rule. There are no re-rolls, no fudging the dice, no meta-currency. The roll of the bones will determine the character's destiny, and no one will be spared their fate. None shall escape the destiny of bone.